just one thank you lauren uh the session is recorded the recording will be shared with attendees as well so do for that um while we have a couple more people coming in i'll just give you 30 more seconds so grab a cup of tea your water and we'll get started So let's get started. Um, as I said earlier, hi, welcome to State of Open Infrastructure Community Conversation on Regional Policy. Um, I would like to start this session by giving a bit of our ground rules. Um, this is a safe space for all. This is space to be inclusive, to ask the right questions, to be curious, hold space for others, be respectful, and just ask all the questions. We love to hear your experience and your understanding of the report. So definitely just put it in the chat, let us know. So about IOI, I'll just give you a brief snap of what we do and who we are. Um, as I mentioned, I am Nikki. I am Business Development Partnership Lead at IOI, fun times here. Um, we are on a mission, uh, our aim is to increase the investment and adoption of open infrastructure. We do this because we believe that scientific engagement collaboration, collaboration requires the tools and services for all by all. How do we do this? We have three different approaches. We have the data room where we are very much... Uh, sorry, Lauren, I was supposed to say next. Next, this is the right slide, thank you. Very much um, evidence-based research stored in our data room. We then leverage all of this for the strategic support that we provide to organizations on understanding and improving their systems. And then we provide funding pilots for organizations ready to adopt infrastructure tools. So infrastructure. Next, please. Now, the reason of being of our gathering here today is the state of open infrastructure report. The report uh, came about from a lot of the evidence that we have gathered over the times and to provide a snapshot of what's happening in the state of open in the, in the open infrastructure space. How does it work? What's going on? Who are the key players? What are the grant fundings? Um, who are part of the conversations? What's happening in different regions? The report objectives, next slide please, is to raise the profile of open infrastructure, to illuminate patterns, establish a baseline of information, so we all have a baseline of where we're coming from, investigate uh, different topics. For today is uh, regional policy development, and identify possible course of actions. The report is a labor of love and it's done by a, a dedicated community of authors, here's the names. Um, we're also grateful for our Sustaining Circle members, uh, the Andrew Mellon Foundation and our Acadia Fund that allowed us to publish this and can we continue to look at how can we publish another one or, but also how to leverage the information that we have gathered in these reports. The topics in the report, next slide, please. Uh, characteristics of selected open infrastructures, the state of open grant funding, um, governance, that's a very big thing, um, trends in open infrastructure performances and adoption, regional policy development, why we're we here today, um, the influence of procurement and governance, um, future signals, et cetera. What is the reality of open infrastructure? We also, next slide please, an understanding that policy is quite contextual, it's very nuanced as well, depending on the region. We have published a more extensive version because we realized in the state of open uh, report, it had to be condensed. Whereas the extended version really gets into details about the different regions um, and what the policy development looks like. For today's guest, for today's session, um, next slide, please. I will be joined by three authors. My colleague, Jerry Salanga, he will be covering Africa and Latin America. Gail Stanhoff will cover the US section, uh, with Emmy Sang covering the European uh, section. Regional policy development is the gate of infrastructure. This is now, I invite Jerry to 
um, present his uh, findings and reports. Thank you so much, Nikki, and thank you to all of the participants who have joined us on this particular conversation. My name is Jerry Selanga. I am the Engagement and Networks Coordinator to Invest in Open Infrastructure, and I'm going to take you on the section on Africa. So one of the things that uh, was apparent when we were doing this particular report and why I actually wanted to start with this particular image is when you're looking at the African context, is when you're talking about open uh, policy, open science policy development and open infrastructure development in general, the prevailing notion from the research is that Africa is still a little bit behind the eight ball in terms of uh, policy implementation uh, and adoption. Uh, and why do I say that Africa is behind the eight ball? Uh, because for example, this is a, con a continent that has 15% of the world's population, but when it comes to the contributions to, to open science, uh, uh, to research, I mean, uh, Africa only contributes 1% to the global research outputs. This is according to a World Bank report. And so why, why is it that we have this deficiency when it comes to open science policy developments and by extension, open infrastructure implementation? Uh, we have had a lot of issues when it comes to challenges with connectivity for a long time. Uh, a lot of the, a significant chunk of the continent was not connected to the external world when it comes to internet connectivity. We also had uh, issues to do with computing capacity. So in terms of like the resources from a computing perspective uh, across different levels of education, that level of technical kind of capacity uh, wasn't there. Uh, also, another thing that also was, was uh, contributing to this kind of situation is when you're talking about technical expertise, how many people actually are aware of open science and open infrastructures, and that also was a barrier in terms of to uh, implement open science uh, policies on the continent. Finally, we also have a very big issue of, of funding, because, for example, when you're talking about open science policies, a big component of that involves the development of infrastructures for you to do capacity building that is required. And for a significant chunk of the continent, the contribution to research from a GDP perspective is still less than 1%. So that contributes to this particular situation. But having said that, it's not all doom and gloom. I think in the past uh, 20 years or so, We've seen a lot of strides in open science policy development and the continent. Next slide, please. So one of the things that happened towards the end of the and uh, the the nineteen the the nineteen nineteenth the twentieth century, I mean, is that uh, we started having the formation of these uh, national research and education networks. Uh, I think it was the South African NREN, which is TENNET, and the Kenyan uh, NREN, which is uh, KENET, which were formed in 98 and 99, respectively. And these are just networks that are looking to kind of enhance access to connectivity, at least that was their primary remit at, at the start of the decade. And over time, now we have seen uh, that there have now been, uh, we've had these kind of bigger groupings that are formed of constituent entrants called the regional research and education networks that are working across Africa, looking to provide solutions primarily to connectivity. So here we have uh, WACREN, which primarily works within the Western Central Africa region, ASREN, which works within the North African and also the Middle Eastern regions. And we have the Ubuntu Net Alliance that also works in uh, Eastern and Southern Africa. And so one of the things that these particular regional formations have been able to do is that they have enhanced the access to connectivity, but also over time now they've also been able to kind of uh, contribute to other things. For example, and talk about identity uh, systems for institutions of higher education, advocacy for open science policy development, that is also a big component. And if you look at this map on the left through one of the programs that we call the Africa Connect uh, 3, and now we are going into Africa Connect 4 with the collaboration of the European Union, there's been a lot of emphasis on capacity 
building and awareness and also infrastructure development on open science. Next slide, please. So when you talk about the actual open science policies that we have in the continent, there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of formulating policies, implementing those policies, and by extension now, making sure that open science uh, develops a, a foothold and, and it actually is able to be applied in different contexts. Uh, what we have seen is that there's a lot of policies that are related to open data and open access, but specific policies related to open science uh, have not yet gathered pace as, as these are the areas that I've just mentioned. So in Africa, the moment we have a lot of uh, countries that infer open science, uh, particularly when you're talking about technology and innovation, but actually across the continent, I don't think there's any single African country that has a purely dedicated open science policy. There's a lot of open data policies and open access policies, but open science policies are uh, not at the moment. Uh, particularly when you're looking at uh, Ethiopia, I think Ethiopia is the only country that has a dedicated open access policy. And we have other countries that are looking uh, at developing these policies in the pipeline. For example, South Africa, Kenya, Ghana, and so many other countries have policies in the pipeline. Next slide. There's also a number of regional initiatives that have uh, developed over the years that are looking at, can we be able to uh, champion open science development? Uh, because one of the things that I mentioned is that there's a big uh, funding deficiency that is there. And so you have like these groups that are formed around these NRENs, RNs, and other research players that are more or less looking at filling this void and developing and championing open science. So for example, we have the African Open Science uh, Platform, AOSP, which is domiciled under the National Research Foundation in South Africa, that is looking at creating a network of federated infrastructures for open science across the continent. It's more or less in the formative stages, it's gathering pace uh, slowly. Uh, there's have a number of regional nodes that have just been inaugurated. So this is something that uh, is gathering pace. We have the Libsense Initiative by WACREN, which is looking at uh, fostering open science capacity building plus also open science policies across universities and uh, even uh, at the country level. And also we have the Science Granting Councils Initiative uh, by uh, IDRC, FCDO, and other development partners that is more or less looking at building capacity for open science within the continent. Next slide, please. So one of the things that uh, we have seen is that uh, there's a number of also different instruments that have been developed over time to support the uptake of, of open science in this particular continent. Uh, first and foremost would be Agenda 2063, which is a policy document by the African Union that looks at, can we actually be able to make sure that Africa is a global powerhouse in all sectors by the year 2063. And key to that particular policy document is the role of science, uh, technology, and innovation. And so the next two policies that are there is we have the STISA, uh, Science, Technology, and Innovation Strategy for Africa, and the Continental uh, Education Strategy for Africa. These are all built on the framework of Agenda 2063. It's just that they are perspectives on this particular issue are different. STISA focuses more on using uh, research in science infrastructures as a catalyst for development. Uh, CESA is more or less looking at the educational system from start to end, from kindergarten all the way to university. And how do you integrate principles of open science across that? We also have the Africa Union Declaration on Internet Governance that is looking at things like, let's say, freedom of expression, privacy controls, sovereignty. Uh, uh, and the, the interesting thing about all of these policies that I've mentioned so far is that they are all initiatives of the African Union. So one of the things that also we are looking at this particular document is the 
implementation piece because sometimes there's a lot of things that are done on paper, but for us to actually take the next step in terms of open science, we're looking at the implementation piece. Uh, I think as I go to the end of this particular section, I would also want to highlight the UNESCO recommendations of 2021 in terms of like the role that they've played in kind of bringing to the fore the importance of open science, uh, making clear uh, the, the resources uh, and the different kind of uh, components of open science that are required to kind of uh, all be invested in. And I think that has given a significant push to the African countries in the implementation of open science. Uh, looking forward, I think one of the things that uh, is important here is just the development of more open science policies, because as I mentioned, we don't have any country with an explicit open science policy in the continent. And also equally important is harmonization of policies. So these policies uh, need to be developed in a way that they are not working in isolation, but rather to foster that element of co cooperation and interoperability. And then finally, we are also looking at increased research funding and investment as a big catalyst for the development of open science on the continent. So let me pause there for now. Uh, I'll be happy to take any questions that you may have. I think that will be at the end of the session, but for now, let me hand over to my colleague, Emmy. Thank you very much, Jerry. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Emmy Tang. I'm the Director of Finance and Operations at IOI. Uh, for this particular report, this particular section, and also for our special issue, so our survey on um, open science policies, in terms of understanding the context in Europe, what we did was to review 56 national open science, research and innovation and research infrastructure policies instruments from across 33 European countries. And so from this review, uh, we noticed that many countries are recognizing the importance of infrastructure in advancing open science practices. And the instruments that we have reviewed mention, for example, building national and institutional infrastructure to support open access and open research data, and where that infrastructure already exists, uh, putting an effort into strengthening it. There, is there are also a number of mentions of uh, existing open infrastructure. So for example, ORCID, uh, DOAJ, the Director of Open Access Journals, and Dataverse, uh, and many more in um, national policies. And that's really a signal of um, how governments and, and uh, national experts are recognizing the importance of these open infrastructures. There are also some policies that talk about um, developing capacity and infrastructure, human infrastructure in particular, in enabling the effective use of these digital infrastructures and to advance open science. And finally, um, there is a number of instruments we reviewed that explicitly emphasize the importance of finding ways to ensure financial sustainability and cost effectiveness of the infrastructures that are being developed or maintained. Next, please, Long. Um, it's also noteworthy that some of these instruments uh, laid out specific provisions around setting up funding programs that are specifically there to fund open infrastructure development. So an example that uh, I would note here is the Open Science Netherlands Work Program 2024 to 2025, which specifically dedicates uh, or lay out the provisions for a 17 and a half million euro instrument to support the development of digital infrastructures that enable open science practices. Um, however, around the time and after we have completed the review, we also note that there are a couple of big budget cuts across Europe. Um, two examples are on the screen here, and this may ultimately cast some uncertainty over the country's investment into open science and open infrastructure, despite the positive signals that we've been seeing in the policy instruments. Next, please. Um, many of the reviewed national instruments also emphasize the importance of actively participating in the development of the European Open Science Cloud, or EOSC. So it's really interesting to see the, recently, the recent announcement of the launch of the EOSC EU node, which will support multidisciplinary and multinational research workflows promoting the use of uh, FAIR, so findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data, 
and interoperable services in Europe. And EOSC EU node will also serve as a reference node for other EOSC nodes to be established. Um, I think it remains to be seen whether and how any sort of potential or, or uh, executed Horizon Europe uh, budget cuts to research and innovation would um, affect or not affect the development of the EOSC EU node. Uh, finally, next slide, I want to briefly mention that we also did do a review of some of the EU level policies that recently came into force or are about to come into force um, and their potential implications on open infrastructure development and adoption. This piece included, the review included policies like the European Data Act, the AI Act and the Cyber Resilience Act. And if you'd like to know more about that analysis, um, please do read the report chapter for more detail. Handing back over to Jerry to talk about the Latin American context. Thank you, Amy. So one of the things that uh, for the regions that we covered in this particular report was also uh, Latin America. And here uh, we did a lot of kind of like literature review in terms of just trying to understand the, the context. And one of the things that we found out was that particularly within the Latin American space, is open science, the way that we define it now, actually has a very deep kind of uh, connection to that particular region of the world because there is a culture that views uh, knowledge as a public good, which more or less is, 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 is what open science is. And this is how those communities in Latin America had always viewed the sharing of, of knowledge for many, many years. And I think if you want to trace the open science uh, development in Latin America, it goes back to formally, that is uh, 1997, when Cielo was formed. So Cielo is uh, an, a, a digital library of open access journals in Latin America. So that uh, kind of like officially was kind of like the start of open science within this particular region. Since then, there have been a number of additional organizations for example, I read Clara, which is the Regional Research and Education Network, La Deferencia, which is the network of open access repositories in Latin America, uh, Latindex, America, and Clasco. All of these organizations are working uh, together to kind of promote open science in this particular region in Latin America. Next. So when you talk about open science uh, policy uh, development in, in Latin America, uh, we have seen that uh, several countries have initiated, uh, have initiatives uh, to promote open science, uh, but uh, dedicated standalone open science policies are still very rare. So we have a lot of policies that to do with open access, for example, in uh, Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, in a number of uh, Latin American countries, these policies that are explicit for open access, but we still do not have dedicated open science policies. When you're looking at this from a national uh, level, uh, one of the countries, the foremost countries that has been there in terms of pushing open science and open policy development is, is Brazil, uh, because that was the birthplace of Cielo. We have the IBICT, which is the Brazilian Institute of Information in Science and Technology. We also have the PAPES, which is the Sao Paulo Research Bureau. So Brazil has more or less played a very strong role in terms of promoting open science and open access in this particular region. For example, even when you're talking about the development of CRI systems, Brazil was the foremost, and now we're starting to see other countries uh, following suit. So we have mandates, uh, legal mandates in a number of Latin American countries that now stipulate that publicly funded research must be dedicated, must be deposited in open access repository. And we believe that this is a very good uh, starting stone or foundational stone for additional kind of uh, focus or shifting into open science over the years. Next. Yes, so one of the things that in, in the Latin American region is that we do not have any one policy that is overarching for 
the, the whole region. Instead, you have a number of different policies. So for example, you have the Santa Domingo uh, Open Access uh, Declaration, you have the Clasco Declaration of Open Access in 2015, you have the Panama Open Science Declaration in 2018. So there's a number of different open science policy, open science policies, but none of them is, is binding. All of them are pretty much on a voluntary basis. But the, the key thing here is that they are indicative of this particular shift uh, from open access now to full-fledged open science. One of the things that also we can see is that uh, a lot of these policies uh, and, and these declarations are often in response to larger macro trends when you talk about uh, the scholarship space. So for example, when you talk about the Santo Domingo declaration that was uh, in 2005, and this was a direct response to the Berlin, Bethesda, and uh, the BAN declarations of open access. And it was kind of trying to look at how do we articulate or localize these global events into our own context. When you look at, uh, for example, the, the Clasco Declaration of Open Access in 2015, one of the things that it was a response to, it was as a response to the article processing charges that were now starting to kind of gain a little bit of, of, of prevalence across the world and kind of trying to look at how do we respond to that. You look at the Panama Open Science Declaration that also was intended as a response to the increasing awareness of open science and looking at how can Latin American countries work together in terms of developing interoperable systems and how do they even share knowledge about advancing open. So uh, there's an increasing emphasis on collaboration as I've mentioned due to that the, the Panama Declaration of Open Science but also we are seeing a number of collaborations even with other entities that are interested in furthering open science outside of Latin America. For example, there is a memorandum of understanding between uh, La Referencia Red Clara with uh, the African Enrens in pursuit of open science. There's also the European Union and the LSE, the Latin American Cooperative that also seeks to kind of work together with the EU in furthering open science. So you're also kind of seeing that kind of uh, openness to sharing information across jurisdictions. And then last but not least, I would want to say that the UNESCO recommendations have also greatly helped to push the narrative and the implementation of open science uh, because uh, the fact that it articulated on issues that are very important to the Latin American uh, uh, landscape. So for example, something to do with multilingualism, because one of the, the key things in the Latin American space is can we be able to actually share our research in our native languages of Portuguese and, uh, and Spanish. And also when you talk about things like uh, citizen science, uh, uh, and I think that has greatly contributed because now you're seeing some countries start to implement uh, things that are mandated in the UNESCO recommendations. So yes, next slide, please. It seems like open science has uh, developed a lot of momentum over the past uh, decades, and this is a very good uh, development. Uh, one of the implications that we are seeing as a result of this momentum is that there's likely going to be more development of open infrastructures in the region, like in the COVID period, there was a number of infrastructures uh, that were developed uh, to kind of help to mitigate and cope with the situation. There's also likely going to be more open access repositories uh, to deposit this information as mandated by this uh, legislation that is coming up. And also when you talk about the contribution of Latin American knowledge into the global uh, reservoir of knowledge that also is going to be a lot more. So uh, finally, I think uh, one of the things that we are seeing is while the momentum for open science is there, there's also a kind of a big challenge that is there when you talk about uh, nationalism and budget cuts that has affected a number of countries in the region. And also when you're looking at 
how do you position the needs of the Latin American community in the context of how open science is, is evolving worldwide. So yeah, thank you for your time. Uh, let me now hand over back to my colleague, Gay. Thank you so much. Um, so for the United States, we're going to take a, a I'm going to take a, a funder focused approach. Um, they really hold an important lever by controlling research funding, and they have a natural strong interest in maximizing the return invest on investment in the research that they fund. One way to do that is to promote open practices in general, but um, providing public access to research outputs in particular. So that'll be that'll be the focus of of this summary. And um, I'll talk a little bit about US federal funders, a little bit about private philanthropy in the United States and the implications for open infrastructure. Next slide, please. So um, most of the current news on policy evolution in this area is the result of two key directives from the Office of Science, Technology and Policy. The first is known informally as the Holdren Memo, came out in 2013. And then the more recent one is the Nelson Memo, both of these named for the, the chief authors of the memos, which came out in 2022. Both of them focus on ensuring free and public access to research publications and data. Uh, Holdren began by focusing on agencies with more than $100 million in research funding and required that grant recipients provide public access to publications and the underlying data, and it allowed for a 12-month embargo on research outputs. The more recent memo, the Nelson memo, extends the Holden memo by um, expanding it to all federal agencies with research funding, allowing for no embargoes, requiring all research data, not just that which directly underlies individual publications, to be made publicly accessible. They make a strong case for attaching persistent identifiers to all research outputs. And they spend some time addressing equity and participation in research and equity and access to results, both for individuals who might be using assistive technology, but also access by machines for programmatic um, access and analysis. And uh, with Nelson, the more recent memo draft policies are due at the end of this year and they're to be in effect by the end of next year. So next slide, please. Um, so a few observations about these policies as they've unfolded. One is that every policy we've seen so far allows for some kind of reasonable and allowable cost of providing public access to research uh, that's allowed in grant proposal budgets. There's no consensus and considerable confusion over what kind of cost is reasonable and a lot of concern over the potential for article processing charges or maybe data processing charges if you're depositing to a data repository to become the predominant mode of providing open access, which raises questions of affordability to researchers um, who don't have as many resources at their disposal. Uh, there's also considerable variation across agencies. In spite of this overarching mandate, we're seeing uh, variability in agency investment in infrastructure. Are they providing repository infrastructure for the research that they fund? Are they expecting researchers to locate on that on their own? It's really all over the map. They vary in their attention to issues of accessibility for individuals and accessibility uh, by machines for programmatic analysis. And they also agencies vary considerably in their readiness to monitor compliance. Some of them have existing reporting mechanisms and infrastructure that they can use. Some of them are just starting to develop that now. Uh, and the potential consequences of non-compliance are largely um, unknown. In spite of all that uncertainty, the National Institutes of Health in the US was really the first agency, major agency to put out some kind of public access requirement back in 2005 with their open access to articles um, requirement. And they were very deliberate, slow but steady in their rollout of uh, additional requirements of standing up mechanism and, and infrastructure for monitoring compliance 
and enforcement. It wasn't until the early teens that they began to hold up grant funding and hold up grant applications for principal investigators who were not complying with their open access policy of 2005. So um, might we expect the same sort of deliberate intentional rollout of, of uh, details and compliance and enforcement with other agencies? I don't see why not, but we the fact is we don't really know. Uh, so next slide, please. Turning now to private philanthropy, there's no similar overarching mandate to impose any kind of uniform requirements, but some of the some funders are uh, developing public access policies, and some of them are working as a community of practice to do that in concert and try to make uh, progress on that front. So um, like US federal funders, costs are generally allowed in grant proposals, although the Gates Foundation made a bit of a splash by discontinuing their support for article processing charges. I think they did that, they did that this year. There is considerable enthusiasm for uh, using preprints as a means of providing early and open access to publications. And um, other aspects of these policies, such as embargoes, accessibility for machines and assistive technologies are really not uh, dealt with consistency, consistently. But we are seeing movement on this front with private philanthropy as well, um, largely because these funders just view it as the right thing to do. And again, there's the, the return on investment question for them. One more slide, please. So what does this mean for open infrastructure? Certainly we can expect some increased usage of repository infrastructure overall and potential questions around sustainability for repositories where revenue doesn't scale with use. And um, we, have a, we have a whole separate uh, project dealing on this reasonable costs uh, issue. And so thank you, Lauren, for putting in the chat a link to a paper we released on the cost and price of providing access to, to research data where we look at which repositories how many repositories charge for deposit and whether, and raise the question of whether or not that, that um, presents some sustainability challenges for them as these policies gain momentum. Uh, another question I have is whether underserved, underserved disciplines, particularly the humanities that are newly subject to these requirements, but maybe lacking in infrastructure might start to see that, that um, gap in capacity exacerbated. And then with respect to accessibility for assistive technologies and machines, I think oversight might be more readily managed with funder operated infrastructure, less so with third party. And especially when it comes to content, um, really not clear where responsibility would lie with ensuring that it is accessible for assistive technology. Does that responsibility lie with the author? Does it lie, uh, lie with the infrastructure? We really, really don't know. And then again, compliance, I think, is the big open question. We don't really know what that will look like and who and how various stakeholders will monitor it and, and deal with it. Um, with that, I'll turn it back to Nikki to wrap up and uh, start us off on a discussion. Thank you, Gil. Thank you, Emmy uh, and Jerry. That was quite insightful. Um, I'm really excited to dig into a bit more in your presentations and would like to ask you a couple of questions. For the member of the audience, do you feel free to put your questions in the chat and then I'll just um, ask the, the crew. Um, Gail, you just wrapped up um, concluding about the applications and compliances. Um, how will the recent policy shift in impact the adoption of open infrastructure in the next five years in your understanding? Gail's question for you to start off. I'm sorry, we you're, you're asking me that question. I thought that that or you were you're sort of taking that question to Emmy and Jerry. Taking to Emmy and Jerry, but also if you're happy to maybe provide some input from your understanding as well, the Nelson memo as well. Okay. Yeah, well, I think I sort of, I think, I think I sort of did that in the last slide with my speculation about what this means for, for infra. So I think I'll leave it to Emmy and Jerry. Yeah. Maybe I can hop in here and um, expand a little bit on what I think from from our review of the European policy, what we're 
some of the things I think we're about to see in the European sphere. Um, so, for example, I think when, in our review, we see that there are quite few many policy, well, actually most of the policies, I would say, were uh, built taking into consideration some of the big international developments like the Budapest Open Access Initiatives, and there are many other ones. Um, and I think with, with some of the recent developments that are really very connected with open infrastructure, so for example, the Barcelona Declaration on Open Research Information and the um, Amsterdam Declaration on Funding Research Software Sustainability, we can expect to see that some of that recent development will start to influence the development of, the, of national institutional or funder policies even in the next five years. Um, and thereby impacting, you know, the, the development and the adoption of open infrastructures in that way. Um, and the second thing that I, I'd like to mention also is that um, while there is still quite a lot of ambiguity around whether or not the European level legislation would affect research infrastructure, because they tend to be sort of set up around for, for digital infrastructures in general, um, these legislations like the European Data Governance Act and the Cyber Resilience Act may mean that some open infrastructure that do in the end fit into the scope of those legislation may have to put in additional mechanisms or effort to ensure that they're meeting those requirements and complying with those legislation. And all of that would mean that there is potential, you know, someone has to bear the cost of, of development of these mechanisms and that compliance. And um, it may in turn affect the adoption uh, of open infrastructure, both from the perspective of the, the adopters, the users, and the, those who are um, developing and maintaining those infrastructures. So it's already speculative, but I do think that we have seen, you know, in the past, a, a track record of how international developments and continental level developments trickle into those national and institutional policies. And I wouldn't be surprised that these, you know, legislative, legislative changes on, on those bigger levels are, are we're going to start seeing those changes in the next five, 10 years in, in the national and institutional contexts. Jerry, what do you think? Yeah, uh, I think uh, particularly when you're looking at Africa and Latin America, where the kind of context is pretty similar in terms of like, sometimes government policy often dictates how things in the end play out. So I think particularly uh, given the fact that now we are starting to see this momentum towards formulation of open science policies at the national level and also with the added layer on top of like the continental uh, policies, I think that might be a good domino effect in terms of like we might see more countries having their own policies. But also, for example, when you talk about uh, overarching kind of frameworks, like let's say the UNESCO recommendations, for example, you're seeing a much bigger emphasis on interoperability and collaboration. So, for example, in the Latin American space, when it comes to the development of uh, CRIS infrastructures, you're already seeing that uh, a number of countries, I think Peru, uh, Brazil, uh, are all already looking at kind of making their systems interoperable. So that particular focus on that is, is going to be quite key and also that makes it uh, if you think about the fair data principles, uh, interoperability is, is a key component there. I think also the other kind of policy implication here would be particularly on the, on the funding bit, because when you talk about Africa and Latin America, uh, I think according to the UN mandate, all countries are supposed to spend at least 1% of GDP on, uh, on R&D. And for the most part, that hasn't happened. I think in both countries, in both continents, I think it's only Brazil and South Africa who have exceeded that particular limit. So particularly, I think that policy, if we are actually able to kind of implement some of these frameworks that we see, that potentially would lead to additional funding that potentially would catalyze open science development and implementation in this context. Thank you. I can just add maybe one more comment, which is going to be a little bit repetitive, but coming at, at this from a slightly different angle, which is just that we spent a lot of time at IOI talking about what we mean when we talk about open and open infrastructure. And it's um, open as a spectrum, as we like to say, but some of the attributes of open infrastructure that I think are pretty uh, widely accepted, let's just say, 
uh, are that, you know, perhaps the open infrastructure is using open source software. It distributes openly licensed or open access content. It's free to use by anyone. It might be community governed, which is admittedly a messy concept, but aspirationally, meaning that the resource couldn't be locked down in some way and uses open standards. And all of these characteristics align pretty well, at least with the policy policies as that they're as they're emerging in the US. And I think what I'm hearing from uh, Emmy and Jerry as well. So all of that sort of points towards an increase in adoption, I would say. Thank you. Um, I would like to unpack a little bit more about the lessons that we've learned through the development of this report. Um, how do you envision success? What are the indicators or parameters that should be considered? Um, Jerry, Emmy, what do you think would be the most insightful way forward or that has been indicators here? Yeah, uh, I think I can go first on this. I think uh, particularly for the regions that uh, I have just presented on, which is Africa and Latin America. I think you can look at this from both a, a quantitative and a qualitative element. A quantitative element would be, uh, as you've seen, it's like majority of the individual countries don't have dedicated open science policies. So potentially it would be okay. Are there in-country localized mechanisms to promote uh, open uh, open uh, science. And also now you can take that one step further because actually one of the things that I think I referenced when you're talking about the African landscape is that there's an element of policy that is there, but then the implementation bit of it because it doesn't help if you have a policy and then you're not implementing that. I think also another maybe indicator of success would be uh, particularly when you're looking at the contribution of these two continents to global research outputs or contribution to kind of like the uh, the, the knowledge commons, uh, uh, so to say, is because like these two continents, I think in terms of uh, they have, I think it's like 25% of the whole uh, uh, population of the, of the planet. But then when it comes to the outputs that are published, it's actually less than 10%. So for me, I'd be looking at more publications, more visibility of research and insights from Latin America and Africa. Thank you. That's a good point. Emmy? Yeah, I think very much in line with uh, Jerry's second point there. Um, I'd like to throw in actually the reverse take of the question, which is like what I'd love us not to focus too much on when it comes to thinking about success. Um, you know, open infrastructure is there to advance open science practices. So it, it is quite intuitive, I think, to, to, you know, think about some of the indicators of success as being, you know, that, you know, the open infrastructures get more used and more data get deposited into the repository, et cetera. But I think it's, it's we need to be very careful about that. It's quite easy to fixate on these sort of numbers but we should remember that open science is perhaps a means to an end. And some of the more meaningful indicators may be around, you know, the types of cultural change that we do want to see with the increase of adoption of open science practices and open infrastructure. Like if, if the ends of our open science is to have more collaborative research, or as Jerry says, more equitable participation and scholarship, then it's really important that we're designing impact measurements around those as opposed to just, you know, the, the usage and adoption of open infrastructure. I'm curious what, what others, uh, including those in the audience, think about this. Thank you. Um, one more question for me. Um, I'm wondering what are additional incentives or interventions might be needed to advance open research policies? You've all touched on it a little bit, so we could just maybe, from your experience as well, what would be an additional incentive to get to those impacts that Jerry and Emmy mentioned? Uh, Jerry, do you want to start or Gil? I think for me, particularly uh, in these two contexts, I think it's just the informational component of this. Because I think one of the biggest barriers that we have is just that people are entrenched in their kind of traditional ways of practicing research and science. And it's just like, there's not yet enough information has propagated to the foundational or formative levels to actually make this a much stronger movement. Because for example, 
earlier this year I was in in Nigeria and we were in this kind of like science conference and there was a question that was asked how many people here know about open science and in a room of around 150 people I think only two people raised their hand so for me that was an indicator of a much bigger problem in terms of the informational uh, bit is there but there still needs to be a lot more that is done both across uh, Africa and Latin America I think that for me would be definitely a, a game changer because I feel like people are still very, very entrenched in how they used to practice research maybe 15, 20 years ago and that has not evolved with how the world has evolved. Yeah, I'll go along with that. I mean, if clearly for researchers, the infrastructure needs to be simple to use and, and free or reasonably and equitably priced. Um, on the provider end, I, I think it's an open question whose responsibility this really is to provide the infrastructure and how that's funded. Um, if it's to be done by the private sector, then there has to be a business model or set of business models that, that work for them. If it's to be done by the funders, then, well, we need more of them to do it. And I don't really know uh, what the answer is there. I do um, want to back up to a point that Emmy made about how uh, in terms of outcomes and measuring success, it's it's sort of it's easy it's easy to say watch the proportion of publications that become open, but this is a a means to an end, and so we want to stop hearing the anecdotes about patient families, patient advocates who can't access the articles that they need, and um, the like. Another aspect of access we haven't talked about is access to the lay public, access to understandable research summaries and you know this whole layer of additional sort of work and creativity that could happen or creation that could happen around research outputs to make it them accessible beyond the the research communities that they originate from so sorry a couple different ideas there but i just wanted to get them out there and and i see there's some dialogue in the chat going on too thank you Gil. Uh, there's a question here um, as the authors from this uh, policy development. Um, do you have any insights from Asia or could you also maybe expand on why we have a special issue on policy and how that connects or if we will have an issue in Asia in the future? Over to you, Emmy. Um, we we wish we have more insights from Asia. <laughs> Um, uh, and you know, it's it's. Um, I'm I'm also curious to to hear like just from a complete digression here. You know whether this sort of continental approach that we've taken here is the right one. Um, Asia is is one of the regions that we have chosen not to cover this round because we three people <laughs> tried our best to cover the parts of the world that you know either we're based in or we we are having active engagement in. Um, and I would. You know, we would love to be able to expand this effort in future iterations of, you know, the state of OI, state of open infrastructure report or the survey. Um, but we also want to do it in a way that really, um, you know, is um, grounded in the the context of local communities there. Let's put it this way. Um, and so uh, if you have any ideas on how who may be great people to engage in that conversation with, please let us know. Um, it's really, uh, yeah, it's, we've learned a lot doing these investigations at either a national uh, or continental level. Um, and I think there's a lot that we can continue to evaluate and see from there to see if, you know, adding Asia is a, is a sensible next step. I don't know if uh, I, <laughs> I'm curious, uh, the, the the research team here um, that, that um, if, if that aligns with your thinking or you have other thoughts there. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to thank the panelists. Thank you so much for participating and for uh, the discussion and diligent answering of the questions. Um, before we close, uh, we'd love to have some feedback on the sessions and what your thoughts are. But also, maybe if you have any tips for us, just Emmy also mentioned, if you have any connections to Asia, we'd love to also take it to the community over there. 
So very much, thank you so much to the panelists. Uh, here is a poll for you to let us know what you think of it, what you appreciate it, um, how we can improve. Um, I would also like to take this moment to uh, mention that our next state of open infrastructure community conversation is at the Digital Library Federation's virtual forum on October 22nd at 11 a.m. ET. The topic will be graceful transition section on our report and will feature a panel with Caroline Edwards, Open Library Humanities, Jennifer Gibson from Dryad, and Peter Seward from Open Access Tracking Project and Tech Team. This will be facilitated by Emmy. You've heard her just speak, so prepare for it. Uh, please check the, the chat for links and for more information on how to register. And if you would like to stay up to date uh, on the next conversations and other state of open infrastructure related news and updates, we are very busy. So do sign up for our mailing list and stay in touch. Uh, and as always, you can um, find us on research and invest in open.org or on our website. To my colleagues, thank you so much. This was brilliant. Thank you.